Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to uh, today's seminar. It's a pleasure to have here today Dr. Michael Robinson uh, from American University in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, Dr. Robinson uh, graduated uh, with a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in mathematics from RPI. And uh, in uh, 2008, he, got, he earned his PhD from uh, Cornell in uh, applied mathematics. Uh, and uh, he's been since, uh, uh, he, he was a postdoc consul at UPenn. And then uh, he's been since at uh, uh, American University. He's uh, Mr. is jack of all trades. He's an engineer, mathematician. Uh, he's the only mathematician I know who actually uses his hands, and uh, and uh, rather than just his brains. And uh, it, it, he's uh, it, it, he's been doing some uh, fabulous work in, in uh, topological data analysis, and in, uh, he's developed in uh, in collaboration with. Uh, uh, Robert Grice at uh, UPenn, his ideas of sheaves and actually making them a little bit uh, uh, more accessible to the applied uh, people like us. So uh, without further ado, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Krim. This has been a fabulous visit, as always. Uh, so I appreciate your hospitality. And I hope this will be something that uh, is interesting to you in the sense that it is some interesting from a theoretical perspective, but also in the applications. Um, and, and by use my hands, I, I don't think he means that, that, that I, I, from an Italian lineage and I use my hands, <laughs> but rather that, that I use my hands to build things. Um, and that's kind of, you'll see that direction here. This is, this is kind of a theoretical talk, but not exactly. You'll see what I mean. So I'm going to talk to you about wireless networks and a, and a method for using topological methods to analyze wireless networks. And not just topological methods like homology, but also to use sheaves as well. Because sheaves are really the, the, the way to store and understand local information. Something that you might have in a wireless network. Because information is local to particular nodes or local to a particular link. Okay, so of course, as is traditional, I'll thank my collaborators. So I have some collaborators from Pacific Northwest National Lab, uh, as well as some of my students. Uh, acknowledge the funding source from the Air Force and from DARPA. Uh, if you're interested in my website, here it is, drmichaelrobinson.net. Sort of obvious, I suppose. Um, and there you can find lots of papers. If you have any questions or want some suggestions, feel free to drop me an email as well. Okay, so let's get started. So the problem is, I want to assess vulnerability of a wireless network. Wireless networks are great. You can use your computer or use your phone, wander around, that's, that's great. Uh, but they do have a tendency of going down a lot, and for various reasons, often due to congestion. Uh, but there can also be some things that, that, that come about because your equipment has failed. Uh, I know this happens a lot at my house, and I get a lot of flack from my family members when the computer goes down. Uh, but then there's also the possibility of something else that, that's not so nice, uh, is wireless networks can be subject to jamming. You can, you can interfere with a wireless network intentionally. And so you'd like to build a wireless network in such a fashion that it's not as easy to jam and bring down in that fashion. Now, when you study wireless network, there are a bunch of problems with it, a bunch of problems that, that are kind of difficult to work with. First of all, the, the physical layer of that network is extremely variable. The physical layer can be rather complicated from a, from a standpoint of connectivity. Uh, and additionally, because it's a broadcast channel, it, it can be really complicated to understand how the network is connected. Um, and connectivity in a wireless network can be kind of hard to measure in practice. And part of that is due to the fact that the media access protocols are a little difficult to, to stick your hand in and watch in a live network. So these are some challenges that, that are come about with wireless networks that I'd like to suggest that there's an abstract methodology. If you step back from the specific protocols, you step back from the specific details of how the network is built, how the radio signals propagate, uh, that'll give you something a little better. You see, I, I got my start, if you will, my, my first real world job uh, was in wireless network simulation. Uh, and not just simulation of a small wireless network, but of a large land mobile radio network. It was supposed to be a, an emergency communication system for the state of New York. And one of the things that came out of that was we had to do an awful lot of physical simulation, 
physical layer simulation in the network where we would say, okay, what is the signal level? What is the bit error rates over this network or over this portion of the network? And they're extremely variable. They're extremely sensitive to all different conditions. It's very hard to model. Um, and what I suggest is rather than doing this very high fidelity modeling like I was doing in the past, uh, we should abstract them. Abstract out the model. Say that any such model that might do something like this should be what we want to do. Uh, this is a bit easier to measure than the specific bit error rates at various locations, and it's less lo subject to change. Um, the point being that if you get local connectivity of the network, that might be easier to figure out, and that will lead to some global inferences through the method of sheaf theory. Um, and once you've got that local connectivity, you can start adding more detail. You can say, okay, I know this network is not just a random wireless network, but it is an 802.11g network. Okay, that tells me something about how the traffic's going to get passed. And we can start encoding some of this protocol layer information into the mathematical structure that we're trying to model, and then draw inferences about how each of those various layers in the protocol stack impact the performance of the network and impact its vulnerability to certain kinds of failure. Okay, so let's see how this methodology addresses the specific challenges. So the first challenge is the physical layer is extremely variable. Well, rather than specifying a single model, which can be subject to all those variabilities, and rather than specifying, say, I've got some distribution of, uh, and some kind of stochastic approach, let's take a parameterized family of models that gives us some flexibility and says, even though the physical layer is variable, the inferences we'd like to make are robust. This also helps us manage some of the complexity in the media access model. Not all of it, but we'll see exactly what that looks like in a bit. Uh, the second thing is that wireless network connectivity, well, that could be really complicated, especially because everything's a broadcast channel. I may or may not interfere with some of my neighbors. I may or may not be pu pulling multicast signals from that. Well, let's abstract that away. What really matters is some kind of connection diagram. Now, it's not a wired network, so it's not just a graph. There's a little additional structure. And we'll see how that turns out to be very helpful. It's simplified, but it's enough complexity that we can capture the, the critical dynamics. And the connectivity being hard to measure in practice, well, if we're using these simplified models, the models that are not particularly detailed, it gives us the, gives us the right intuition for how to do the measurements. And that's very handy. Okay, and the final thing is with regards to media access. If I'm trying to locate information in my network, it's not just located in space or in time. It's located in space and time. And the media access protocols are aware of this. You do a collision detection. How do you do collision detection? Well, you say sense for carrier. If I sense for a carrier at a particular node, what I'm doing is I'm having some view of the local environment. And I'm using that view of the local environment to determine whether or not I'm going to use the channel. That kind of thing can be modeled in this particular topological way using a particular kind of sheaf, which I'll show you. Okay. So, first of all, we need to build a simplicial complex model of a network. Assemble the network in a way that is as a topological space, but in a way that is easy to understand and easy to manipulate. Okay. So, what does that look like? Well, first of all, I'm going to call out that Topology is not exactly topology, i.e., uh, what you think of as network topology is not exactly a topological space. It's kind of related. And in particular, when you think about the, the network topology of a wired network, you're kind of thinking of a, a graph structure. Now, a graph structure is not what I think of when I think of a topological space, because in particular, if I have a node that's connected to two other wires, so I have some data that can come in and out this way and some data that can come out this way of a single node. Well, okay, that's a particular connection structure. As far as a topological space is concerned, that's no different than a single wire. But, of course, from a connectivity standpoint, that's really rather different because there's actually a queue living in here, possibly several queues. There's a whole bunch of, of electronics that's in there. So the network topology, which includes all the electronics and the queues and whatnot, <coughs> they're not the same as the topological space. We're going to make that distinction by separating out the topology in the topological space sense from the topology in terms of queues and other such data. And we'll see how exactly that gets built up. So the point is, in a wired network, too, the wires 
are edges, and the edges are wires in some sense, and they, they're actual wires. In, in a wireless network, though, I don't really have a wire from here to there. Of course, that would not be a wireless network. So what do I have if I have two nodes that are communicating, or three nodes that are communicating? They don't have physical wires that go between them. They, they're using a broadcast resource. Several of these connections are made at once. So there ought to be the right way to represent that that isn't just a wire, and it isn't just a, a, a single connection. It should be something that's somehow capturing the fact that I'm, I'm accessing a broadcast channel. The right way to do this, I, I posit to you, is by using a higher dimensional kind of structure that captures the fact that I'm getting multiple connections at once. So I, the point is that I can still use the idea of a vertex as a node, as it were in the graph model, but now I start using some higher dimensional data to capture that broadcast. The dimension, then, tells me something about how much broadcasting is happening. If I have a, just a dimension one face, that dimension one face is like a wire. Dimension one means I'm connecting two nodes. Dimension two means I'm connecting three nodes. Dimension four means I'm connecting five nodes, etc. So dimensionality tells you roughly how many nodes are sitting on that particular broadcast resource. Okay, so let's do a little mathematics. So we want to build a simplicial complex. A simplicial complex is a representation of a topological space that has all of this machinery. So we start out with, as you would in a wired network, with a bunch of vertices representing individual nodes. Okay, so here are, say, four nodes in my network. They're vertices. I, I represent them just merely by their labels. Okay, now what about links between them? So if, say, for instance, node V1 and V2 can communicate, I can put a link in there. If V1 and V3 can communicate, I put a link in there. If V2 and V4 cannot communicate, then I don't put a link in there. This is just like a wire, wired network. Okay, nothing too fancy there. But what if nodes 1, 2, and 3, actually, it's a wireless network, they're sharing a broadcast resource. They're communicating with one another in some fashion. Then I can put in a higher dimensional simplex. And what this means is this means that any of the nodes whose faces are V1, V2, V3, any of those any of those nodes there, if any one of them talks, the others hear it. So it, it's telling you something about simultaneity of transmissions. Now, I'll make a comment. This is assuming that I've got a reciprocal channel, as in I'm not doing anything funny, that different thresholds are there and whatnot, where I, where I might end up with a transmission happening one way and not being able to come back the other way. We'll hit that in a moment. But the point is, if you assume a reciprocal channel, that's, that's pretty... Pretty reasonable in many situations, so we'll stick with that assumption. Okay, so some terminology. If I have a high dimensional face that doesn't, isn't part of any other higher dimensional faces, we'll call that a faucet. So for instance, this guy here, that's a faucet. This guy here is a faucet because there are no higher dimensional faces attached to it. However, this particular edge right here, that edge, has a higher dimensional face that is attached to. It's attached to a two-dimensional face. That's not a faucet. A and similarly, this vertex here is also not a faucet because it's got a higher dimensional face. It has several. One, two edges attached to it as well as this two-dimensional face. The distinction between faucets and not faucets is that a, a faucet represents the entire broadcast resource. If it's, not, if it's not a faucet, it means it's part of some larger broadcast resource. Okay. So let's try to tie in the physical model, because thus far I've just got connectivity. So I, I don't want to specifically specify a signal-to-noise ratio, bit error rate, or any of the other various parameters that might characterize link quality. I'll assume they exist so that we can link up to it, but I'm not going to specifically say what they are. I'm not going to write down an equation specifying propagation, for instance. And, I, and I, that's part of my discipline is that I don't want to. I don't want to rely on that. So it's sufficient just to merely say to each node it has a certain region of coverage, an open set in, say, Rn where it lives, uh, that that's where the transmissions could go. And then there's a function, a signal strength function, which is kind of like a probability measure that says, it's not a probability measure, it's just a probability function, says, if I were to place a receiver here, what's the probability that I could make a good connection? So I, I end up with a coverage region, open set, and on that open set I have a function that takes on a value between 0 and 1. That value is a signal strength function. It essentially gives me some notion of, of how well the signal is getting received on the other end. 
still fairly abstract. I'm not saying anything about what the signal strength function is, merely that it is continuous. Okay. So given that, I can start talking about when I'm going to put in my link. So to give you a very precise condition that says whether or not I should put in a link. So these are two coverage regions. And what you can do is you can say if this node here can receive that, well, it can't because it's outside the coverage region, uh, that then, then if it can receive it and the other one can receive, so they can mutually receive each other's communications, I either signal strength functions, first of all, are defined at those locations, and second of all, exceed a detection threshold, we're good. We'll, we'll put in an edge. So in this particular case, th that the red transmitter here, the red transmitter is not transmitting enough signal to get to the green one. The green one happens to be transmitting enough that the red can get, can get there. Uh, I said this is a, a, a reciprocal channel, so that means that if I were to move this green guy over to there, that we'd be fine, and in fact, that's exactly what's happening. If I move the red and green guys so that the enough signal strength gets between them, then I can put in an edge. This gives me a graph structure. If you take the flag complex of this object, so if I have a triangle, I fill it in with a two-dimensional simplex. If I have a, what looks like the, the, the one skeleton of a tetrahedron, I fill that in with a tetrahedron, etc. That object I'll call the link complex, but it's just a flag complex on this particular d construction. This is telling me, the faucets are telling me, something about the broadcast resources in this network to make transmissions from here to there, from one node to the next, and each faucet tells me the maximum broadcast region associated to that particular link. Okay. Now, this is great if I have an ad hoc wireless network. What if I have, you know, Ad hoc wireless networks are great for theoreticians. We love ad hoc wireless networks because everything's uniform. But frankly, most of you probably have devices in your pocket, or at least near your pocket, uh, that does not use an ad hoc wireless network, but uses a star type network, it uses one that talks to access points. So let's take a look at a, a kind of complex, not the link complex, that would work well for that. And that, that's something that I'm, I call the interference complex. If you know about check theory, this is kind of like the check complex. Uh, essentially what it does is it says rather than putting in an edge when two nodes can mutually communicate, this is the situation where two nodes can interfere with each other's mobile receivers. So in particular, if I have a mobile receiver that's located, say, right here in the intersection region between these two coverage regions, if the red transmitter and the green transmitter are talking at the same time, that mobile device will hear both signals. It will, it will sense some interference, even though the, red, the green transmitter is completely none the wiser. So this is an instance where, where the edge indicating there, the edge in there indicates that these two systems can interfere with one another. On the other hand, of course, if they pull their regions apart altogether and there's a nice big gap between them, then we don't put in an edge. So this is merely saying whether or not the coverage regions intersect. So that's why I said it's like the check complex. The, the handy thing about the interference complex is, is it is sort of a, it, it gives you a, a more conservative estimate on, on how much noise might be in the system. I mean, you may not have a mobile receiver here. The mobile receiver might never actually go there. But this is saying that there's a potential for interference. So this is giving you a, a different way to look at that same kind of network. Okay, and the interference complex is very handy in a lot of the systems that are already in existence. Those systems that have access points, or for instance, the cell phone network has access points that you're dealing with. And in this case, each faucet of this complex now, rather than being a maximal broadcast resource, tells you that the maximum amount of interference that could be happening. It's telling you that if you were to transmit from any one of the nodes that participate in this faucet, all of these other nodes need to be silent to avoid having any kind of interference. Now, from a media access standpoint, that might be hard. Uh, and indeed, when I was working uh, for the state of New York to build their system, that was one of the major concerns, is that I can have access points that are communicating whose coverage regions overlap, and they're none the wiser. Okay, so those are two complexes that are very handy. And it's, it's in, intuitive in some sense, but it's worth hammering the point home that they're not the same. That, that the, if I have, say, for instance, these three overlapping thresholded coverage regions, um, two and three can communicate mutually. So in the link complex, there's an edge. But one and two, there they are, the red, the red guy and or one and three, the red guy and the blue guy, they, they cannot communicate. So there is no edge. There's no edge here. On the other hand, there is a point 
there is a point in which all three of their coverage regions intersect. It happens to be right there. So if I were to place a mobile receiver there, it would get interference from the, any of the other two. So the interference complex is, is quite a bit larger. Indeed, this is, this is coming right from the, the, the check theory that usually the, the link complex is a subcomplex of the interference complex it, for the, the same choice of thresholds. So this is kind of handy. That, that we have these two models that we can play around with. Now, what can we do with it? Thus far, there are topological space models. They're not that hard. If you take a first pass, what does the topological invariance look like? Well, one topological invariant you might have is the number of holes. What does the hole tell you in this, in this simplicial complex model? Well, it means that traffic might have to kind of go the long way around. Or put another way, if I have higher dimensional structure that is non-trivial topologically, it means the network is somehow kind of thin and traffic is limited to being on, the, on this thin region rather than cutting through the middle. So in particular, here's, here's a, a situation where I have a hole. This particular network has got a big hole in it. This one is kind of filled in. The traffic has to travel around the outside, where rather here it can just sort of cut through the middle. So it, mean, it tells you something about how hard it is to get traffic across the network. Now, on the other hand, I, I don't necessarily know the signal strength functions exactly. That was sort of the premise. Uh, so what you might do is you might say, well, I, let me try to parameterize them in some fashion to let me manipulate just where I think the, that signal strength is. I don't really know, but let me sweep through a bunch of possible ones and see what that gets. And that leads to a, to a use of persistent homology. So for instance, if I have these four nodes, like the ones we had seen initially, and I, I'm making a very conservative estimate on how much signal they're producing, say so they're not producing very much signal, there'll be sort of three, in, three not connected coverage regions. That means if it's, if it's a base station kind of network, there's very little interference. So if I'm looking at the interference complex, there's not much interference. If you're looking at the link complex, they can't communicate. And as a result, you end up with a number of connected components, dimension zero topological elements. Now, as I slowly increase the size of that coverage region by saying, well, maybe they're putting out more power, or maybe I'm accepting potentially more bit error rate, uh, then these regions get larger. And at some point, they start to merge. These two now have started touching, so there's some interference that can happen between these two nodes, uh, or between, the, the, between this node and its base and the mobile receivers of the other one. And of course, as it gets larger, they, they can connect. And now I have a loop, so traffic that might occur in this network may have to travel around the network in order to get from here to here. It may have to pass around either this way or this way. It can't go directly. And that's witnessed by the, the existence of a one-dimensional topological element. OK. Now, in some sense, this is, this is kind of a baby thing. Because at some point, when these get really big, they're just all glommed together. And that's somehow not helpful. In fact, this is overall not helpful because it's not modeling the media access at all. And the media access is really important. In fact, the media access is one of the things that gets swamped in one of the standard attacks on wireless networks, where you throw a large amount of traffic at it until it breaks. So we want to model that media access protocol in some reasonably simplified way, but still capturing the dynamics. So the idea is this. If I have a wireless network, I can have multiple net nodes transmitting. It's like a wired network. I can have multiple nodes transmitting, provided they're far enough apart. If they're far enough apart, their coverage regions don't intersect, so they can talk without interference. And if they're nearby and they're talking, well, they can do a carrier sense, and they can say, is there some signal? If there's some signal, I'll wait. And if there's not some signal, I guess I'm good to transmit. So that allows us to, to do some kind of communication, but immediately brings up the combinatorial question, what possible configurations of transmitting nodes are possible? So what, what configurations of transmitting nodes are allowed without breaking this media access protocol? In particular, without breaking the collision avoidance aspect of this protocol. Now, the insight from chief theory is that this is a local this is a global question, but it's driven by local constraints. My media access, when I'm accessing the media, uh, is something that depends on two things. First of all, the spatial separation, and the second, the temporal se separation. Either I'm, I'm, I, I'm not asking, hey, do I have to communicate with the entire network? I just ask locally. Good example of a, of a non-local network protocol, fortunately not used very much anymore, is token ring. I've got to wait until the token comes back to me through the entire network before I can talk. Not so with, 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 with the carrier sense kind of uh, media access. And these local constraints then, I can encode them in a sheet. So let me show you how to do that. 
So first of all, what is a sheaf? A sheaf is nothing more and nothing less than local data on a network or on a topological space. So let's start from what we have that describes locality, a simplicial complex. Okay, so if I take that simplicial complex and I've got some data on I could write this thing in terms of the sets, and the sets include one into the other. V1 is a subset of this edge. This edge is a subset of the face, merely as sets like this. Now, whenever I see arrows like this, I, I am a mathematician. I am an algebraic topologist, which means that I very much wanted to be a category theorist when I grew up. And that means that whenever I see arrows like this, I try to abstract the whole thing. And rather than putting just these particular sets here, I can put whatever sets I like. So a sheaf is me assigning some data to each of those particular sets. So to each face in my network, I assign some data. I call that the stock over each vertex and over each edge and over each face. So those are the stocks. I've just put them down kind of willy-nilly here. I'm going to tell you how to do it in a way that respects the media axis in just a moment. Now, each of these arrows are still there. I, I should do something with them. Well, if I have Rn's or whatever, these Rn's, what's the natural kind of map that one puts on Rn? A linear map. So I should put linear maps on all of these. Linear maps are, of course, matrices. So I can put matrices here. Now, I can lay down these matrices however I like. I, I'll call them restriction maps because essentially what you're doing is you're restricting your attention from all of the traffic at one node, say here, to the traffic that, that involves this link. And then if I take this link and take a look at it, well, maybe it involves the rest of the, this, this broadcast link, so I'm restricting my attention to just the broadcast portion of it. So that's a restriction. Now, these, these matrices were kind of assigned randomly for this example, but I do have a constraint. And the constraint is that if I compose matrices any which way to get to, from one particular node to another node or to another face in my diagram, uh, and I multiply matrices as I go, I better get the same thing. So in particular, if I go from this vertex to this edge to this two-face or from this vertex to this edge to the two-face, I better get the same answer when I multiply matrices. Assuming, I, assuming that's all good, we're in good shape. This thing is then called a sheaf. All right, handy. What can sheaves do for you? Well, they, they manage local information. So here we go. I, I can assign some vectors out of each of those vector spaces. There they are in green. And it's a section whenever I map them along by the various maps. So in this case, matrix multiplication. Matrix multiply go from here to here. I, so if I row into column, I get zero. Row into column, I get one, just as I've written there. This happens everywhere over the whole thing. I call this a global section. Now, if I'm calling it a global section, maybe that adjective is telling me something. Indeed it is. Here's another section, but it's not global. Because in particular, if I map from here to here, what do I get? Zero, two. From here going up, I get zero, one. They're not the same. So if, that, if these maps are violated, then that's a local section. It's not a global section. So this is telling me something about information that's on this network and how it fits together. Now, how do I make it do media access for me? That's a great question. So here's a, a wireless network. Maybe you could think of this as the link complex of a wireless network. And what I do is I notate where I make the stock, not a vector space now, just a set. And sitting over each of the nodes and each of the edges and each of the faces, I list the adjacent nodes. And I also add one additional special symbol. That special symbol means idle. And so the interpretation here is this is saying what could be happening on the channel right here. Either node one could be transmitting, node two could be transmitting, or no one could be transmitting. So it's either one, two, or idle at that particular spot. If I move my attention over to this edge, that's a link between node one and two. So who could be transmitting? Node one could be transmitting, node two could be transmitting, or it could be idle. Now, if I move over to here, Node one could be transmitting, two could be transmitting, as before, but also three and four, or possibly idle. And of course, what about over here? Well, node two could be transmitting here. Node four could certainly be transmitting, could be idle. And you know what? Actually, uh, node three can also impact this link because it's not the full broadcast resource. The full broadcast resource is that two-dimensional faucet. So you take all of, the, all of the nodes that come from the vertices of the faucet that you're included into. So this says this link can be used by either two, four, or three because it's a broadcast link. 
Okay, now that's, that's the sets, but I said there's, there's some functions. The restriction maps, what they do is they tell me if node 2, if I'm at node 2 and I hear node 2 transmitting, well, at this link, node 2 is probably still transmitting because node 2 can use this link. So I should map this 2 over to 2. What about, let's see, node 3, node 3. If node 3 is transmitting, sure, node 3 will, will all hear it. Node 2 can also hear node 4. So, yeah, that's the same. Uh, now, what about if the link is idle here? Well, if the link is idle here, it means that this link also had to be idle because anything on that link, node 2 will hear. Now we've got to ask ourselves, what happens if node 1 is transmitting? Node 2 will hear it, but the, these guys will not hear it because they're not linked up with node 1. So what this means is this means that this node 1 transmitting here will result in me only hearing idle on this link. I won't hear node 1 there. So that's the way the restriction map works. Pretty handy. So this means that we can now examine what the <clears throat> with this activation sheath. This sheath is mo monitoring the, the media access protocol, what it does. So if this is the link complex, here's the sheath sort of in brief. Um, I've got nodes 1 and 2 that could transmit here, or it could be idle here, 1, 2, or 3, and here 1 and 3. Well, there are some possible global sections. So one possible global section is that node 1 is transmitting. That will cause node 1 to hear itself, sure. The link attached to node 1, that'll hear it. Node 2 will hear it. But node 3 and its link will not hear it. If node 2 transmits, then everyone hears it. So you can think of this as a combinatorial way to get at who's transmitting when. Now you can ask, all right, do I have to go search through all of these possible combinatorial objects to understand what the traffic looks like? Well, one thing that happens when you start looking at the activation patterns, looking at the global sections, is that they, they're actually kind of separate, which makes sense. If, if you look at the activity of a wireless network, there are some dead zones when various nodes are talking, assuming the protocol is being followed. Uh, so for instance, here the red node is transmitting, here the green node is transmitting, and there's, a, there's an idle dead zone between them because this, these nodes here, well, they're hearing the green node, so they're quiet. They're not transmitting themselves. This node is hearing the red node transmitting, so it's not transmitting. So this portion here is preventing interference between the two halves of the network. Okay, so in some sense, a, a global section of this activation sheath is built up in linear combination of these various smaller pieces. Now I say, with quotes, linear, sec linear combination, because uh, this is not a vector space. I'm not adding things. I'm doing something kind of like adding, but I'm not adding things. It's actually, there, there, there's a lattice structure that's getting played off of here. But the point is, the point is that this is a good way to tear this apart. So I can think about tearing apart just the red or just the green region, associating them to the various transmitting nodes. So for instance, I can call the active region the portion of a given section. So here's S as a section that, I, that I've got. The portion of the section that is hearing red transmitting is right here, this portion. And it's not these, these particular faces of my simplicial complex. It's just these faces. So all the nodes, all the edges, and that two-face are part of the active region for red in this section that we were just looking at. Similarly, here's the active region for the green node. Okay. Seems reasonable enough. Now, when you start playing around with these things, you say, well, let me turn on a different section, look at the various active regions associated to the, the nodes that are there. You start saying, you know, these look kind of similar to what they were a moment ago. Well, that's kind of neat. I in fact, provided a node is turned on in that section, uh, that active region is not actually sensitive to the section. So whenever I turn on a node, it's got the same activation, uh, same active region. Okay? The other thing is that this is actually a closed, connected subcomplex. So in particular, it means that I light up all of the vertices and faces, and I can just yank out the active region and view it as a simplicial complex on its own. I don't have to think about it in context of the rest of the network if I don't want to. Okay, that's kind of cool. The other interesting thing is that, they, that they're they're somehow strongly disjoint. So if I have the, the red active region here, and I have the green node, if I take its active region and take a look at the star, all of the higher dimensional faces that glue onto that active region, that star does not intersect the active region. Kind of looks like it might intersect here, but what's happening is these edges come in, but the star over the active region of the, uh, for the green node doesn't include this vertex. It's not a closed sum complex, it's open. And of course, it's true the other way for the other node. Again, here's the star over the active region of the red region. 
So the point is that the star over an active region is an open set because the active region itself is closed. So that's handy. So I can start saying, well, what does that allow me to do? That allows me to tear apart the network based on active regions in a way that preserves subcomplexness, which means that I can start doing computations nicely. So let me show you how that works. <clears throat> what I do is I say, if I turn on a particular node, or now let me generalize to phases, if I take a look at the star over the closure of that face, star over the closure of a node is just its active region plus its star, because the closure of a node is just a node, it's a closed set. Uh, but in the case of any other faucet, that gives me an idea of the region of influence of that particular link. In particular, if I were to interfere with that link, what portion of the network is going to go down? That's what this answers the question. It tells me if I, if I had someone that was interfering with this broadcast link, who's going to be silenced by that because of the media access protocol? They're going to back off. Well, none of these nodes here are going to transmit. That means that all of these links are going to be silenced. Okay, now what's of course nice about that since it's an open set, the complement of an open set is closed, so here's the complement, it is closed indeed. Closed and closed, check, it's a closed subcomplex. That's handy computationally. So let's take that very basic topological invariant and let's soup it up. So what, what I'm gonna do is show you two invariants, one that's based on relative homology and one that's based on persistent homology. The persistent homological one is somehow global and the relative homological one is somehow local. And essentially, this is answering the question about the vulnerability of the entire network to a specific source of interference. This is going to tell you about the vulnerability of the network to a link failure, specific point link failure. Both of them are time independent because my media access model that I've built in here is, is time independent. So, for instance, the persistent homological invariant, what you do is, is you say, let me take an interference source and take a look at its signal strength and look at how it knocks out more and more links as it's interfering with those links and remove their region of influence as they get larger and larger. Suppose I had an interference source right about here. If it's really quiet, it's not taking down any portion of the network. No links are down. Now, as, as I start to make it larger, stronger, it's going to take out, say, this link there and its region of influence. So it takes out that link. These two nodes are silent. And so it knocks out that portion of the network. Here, two links are down and it's starting to cause a pretty substantial problem for the network. And now at this point here, since we're using a pers uh, homological approach, uh, essentially what this is trying to do is this is trying to answer the question, when is the network starting to become disconnected? It's kind of a coarse invariant. It's not the best, but at least it's something that's fairly easy to measure and can be measured in a reasonably quick distributed fashion. Okay, so what you end up with is you end up with some filtration of links being knocked out. Start out over here, no links being knocked out. Here, you've knocked out the whole network. So progressively more links getting knocked out. Of course, if I take a look at the closure of each of these faucets, take the star over each of those faucets and then complement them in that order, uh, I, I'll end up with a filtration that goes the other way. Here, this is the portion of the network that's up. Well, I didn't knock down anything, so everything's up. Here, I've knocked down the entire network. The whole network is down. This leads, then, <clears throat> if I take homology and all these things, each of these are inclusions that go this way. They're continuous maps. Therefore, they induce uh, morphisms on homology spaces. So I end up with maps that look like this. This is a persistence module. Great. So what can I do with it? Well, for instance, here's a, a random network that, that I just drew up and said, all right, here's a random network. Let me ask for the, the influence of interference source one, which, as you might imagine, uh, as this interference source gets, gets kind of big, it's going to separate these two halves of the network. You'll see that as a homological failure. On the other hand, this interference source, he'll t take out portions of the network, sure, but it'll only be the portion of the network that he's deafened that's really going to be a problem. Any nodes that's sort of over here that are, that are, well, not actually getting interfered with still can communicate perfectly well over here. So in some sense, this is a more detrimental interference source. It's splitting the network by, by turning on. So what this global persistent homological invariant does is it discriminates between this kind of vulnerability, which is pretty bad, versus that vulnerability, which is less so. And in essence, you do the usual persistent homology dance then with this data, and you get something like this. This is computed uh, using the homological tool uh, Perseus, which runs very nicely. It's a C++ library. Actually, Perseus is the only one that I know of that runs on my cell phone natively. 
It's pretty small and light, not lightweight. Uh, so I'll put a little plug there because I, I like it in that regard. And okay, those of you who are used to seeing persistence diagrams, uh, this is a this is sort of transposed. I don't know why I transposed it. Sorry, apologies. Um, but the point is, the circles are due to interference one, and the dots are interference two. The distance from the diagonal tells you the, the significance, and the distance from that diagonal, well, that's telling you which of these interference sources has, has caused more persistent topological change in the network. You can see interference source one definitely did that. Interference source one split the network into two halves. That's a major homological change, rather than interference source two, which really didn't. So interference source one is, in some sense, a, a worse source of interference. Okay, now if we play off of this idea of this knocking out portions of the network and asking what happens, uh, we, could, we could also do this from a relative homological point of view or a local homological point of view, asking what's the, what's the, the hazard of now knocking out or node n going down? So if I have node n going down, I, I'll use this local homology to do that. Now, every time I work with local homology, I get confused about what gets deleted and whatnot. So let me show you how this works because this is a little, little non-obvious. This is a relative homology, and roughly the idea is it means that I take my network, x, and I stop thinking about everything over here, x delete that region of influence. And as I said, I always get tangled up in this, so let me walk you through it. So here's the whole network. Now, here's the region of influence of the node 4, node n. This is the region of influence. It is what? The closure over the star, an open set. The closure of a, of a closed set is just the closed set, that node, and here's the star of it. So there it is. Okay, now I'm not just taking that region of influence, I'm deleting it. So let me delete it. So if I delete the region of influence, this is what I'm left with, all of this stuff here. Okay, but now, now what does this say? This says I want to measure one relative to the other, the whole network relative to this. That's essentially saying take this portion here, the, the, the portion that I've darkened, and glue it all to a single point. Cone it off, to use some topological terms. When I cone it off, what do I see? Well, I see that it's a space that really looks like, uh, it's, like it's basically got two parts. One broadcast link that goes this way and goes into that rest of the network, and the other goes off this way, again, also into the rest of the network. You can think of the thing that I'm quotienting as the portion of the rest of the network I'm not considering. So that's gotten glued off. So this is telling me, in some sense, well, this has got one component, so H0 is non-trivial in its dimension one. H2, uh, H1, rather, it's got a loop, though. So H1 has got a dimension one. This is kind of measuring the fact that this thing, roughly speaking, looks like a graph of degree two, graph node of degree two. It's a generalization of graph degree. In fact, it is graph degree if I eliminate all of the dimension two and higher faces. Okay, so what does this do for you? Well, first of all, due to excision, this is a local invariant. The second thing is it generalizes degree. And the third thing is that it actually gives you an upper bound on the number of components the graph gets chopped, or the network gets chopped into when I interfere with that link. So it's, it's an upper bound. It's not exactly a bound. Or it's not exactly always met. Here, if I knock out this link, well, the network's still connected and nothing else changes really substantially. Although if I hit over here, it splits it into two pieces. So this bound actually gets obtained the, a, a, a useful condition, it's not a necessary condition, but it certainly is a condition, uh, if, if the network is actually fully, simply connected. Handy to know. Here's a picture of, of a random network labeled according to its relative uh, local homology. So knocking out anyone on this particular face here doesn't split the network up into different pieces, it just cuts off the portion. Here it knocks the network into two pieces, here it knocks it into one, two, three pieces. Okay. Now, these are all very simple models. What I want to spend the last few minutes of this talk doing is showing you how I can generalize this a bit to more sophisticated models uh, and more sophisticated models of traffic. And this is where the sheaf theory really comes in handy and really shines. Because sheaves can model priority queues and sheaves can model first in, first out queues. Here's a, here, here's a three deep linear first in, first out queue. And essentially what it is, is this, these are all the time steps. These R threes here are the three dimensional time steps of each contents of the queue, and what gets preserved from one time step to the next is, well, except everything except for the thing that fell off the end of the queue. So it's a two-dimensional thing. These are all projection matrices that link up the fact that I've taken my queue, I've moved it forward by one, thrown off something there, picked up something new, and I keep walking along. 
So sheaves can model those cues. Here's an example. So if I take, for instance, this 1, 1, 9, and I multiply it by this matrix, I get 1, 9, i.e. I chopped off the first 1. Go the other way, it chops off the 9. So I can build this model of a Q. And you can see this continues as much as you want in either direction. It's kind of neat. It's a little, little bit of a sheaf acting like a machine for us. Well, you can actually build up a model. This is a model of two nodes communicating. And here's node 1 and node 0. This is the spatial this is the spatial direction, this is the time direction. The transmitting Q in this particular case is N samples long. This has got a transmit Q and a receive Q built into it. This is the same portion of the sheaf we had a moment ago, that same activation sheaf telling me who is transmitting. Well, node either 0 or 1 is transmitting, or it's idle. There's two of them because now the transmitting Q is telling me I'm keeping track of whether or not node 0 or 1 was transmitting at this time step or the next. And that's getting maintained as we move along. This is then the state of the link. The link is either active or not over the period of time. And this is then the link in space. OK, so how does this work? Well, if you tear apart this thing, I've got the previous transmitting ID, either 0, 1, or no one. The current transmitting ID, 0, 1, or no one. The receive queue and the transmit queue. The receive queue is one deep in this particular example, because otherwise it wouldn't fit on the slide. So these are the three possibilities. If, if node 0 is transmitting, node 1 pulls something into the receive queue. If node 1 is transmitting, it, it grabs the last item in its queue, dumps it onto the link, and pushes it out. And here, no one is transmitting. Nothing is happening. Everything is idle. OK, so that's what's happening in space. Here's what's happening in time. It looks very complicated. It looks insane. But it's not. It's just linking up the various pieces. So here what's happening is if node 1 were transmitting, here, if node 1 were transmitting, what it does is it advances its queue. So in particular, that dn, the thing it just transmitted, falls off the queue, turned to 0. On the other hand, what happens in the next time step? Well, if transmit 1 was happening, it has to advance its queue. Again, you can see the queue is shifted. Otherwise, the queue stays the same, and data either passes in or out of the receive queue. So this particular sheaf theoretic machine keeps track of all the traffic and manages the flow of traffic through the network. And of course, this, I, I don't have to do this on a single link. I can do this over the whole network. This gives me a sheaf theoretic way to manage all of the traffic. Now, this is a little bit hazardous, because now it looks like I can model the whole thing. But I didn't want to set out modeling the whole thing, now did I? It came from the, from the outset saying I want to abstract away without modeling everything. This is kind of beside the point. I've got this really high fidelity store and forward queue model. Gosh, that's going to be computationally awful. I don't want to do that if I can avoid it. So the problem is that the, the stocks that I've built into this thing, they're all set valued. They're all set valued with no algebraic structure, which really impacts my ability to manipulate things. What I really want to do is I want them to be, mm, I don't know, I'll have better algebraic structure. Like, let's hope, hope for everything. Let's hope that they're vector spaces. I could take all of those maps and lift them into vector spaces by what mathematicians like to call categorification. Now, if I say this to mathematicians, they're like, yes, categorification to the rescue. It's wonderful. We, we know we can do categorification on all sorts of spaces, all sorts of settings, and get great invariance. And in fact, there's a nice way to do that. You can just take all of your set-valued maps. They lift into linear maps, sort of as this diagram would show. But as an engineer, we've got to say, really? Categorification to the rescue? Now I'm managing huge vector spaces. That could be bad. And indeed, interpretation is hard. And this is one of the places where I'm now starting to end up into the research effort is to understand. If I do categorify my network, what does that mean? It means that I can now end up with pure states. I know what they mean. Transmitter A is on, transmitter B is off, transmitter C is off, transmitter A is on, B, or A is off, B is on, etc. Those make sense to me. But then, unfortunately, well, something that looks like quantum mechanics shows up, and I end up with mixed states. Transmitter 1 and 2 are not supposed to be transmitting at the same time, but they kind of are. I'm not really sure what that means. Perhaps what it means, and in some contexts what it means, is it means that, there, that, that the link is in a transitionary state. Or it could mean that there's some kind of interference. So this can be really kind of tricky, because I'm partially violating the, the, the collision avoidance. So I don't quite know what to do with it. Now, on the other hand of things, to make this practical, we need to like, simulate something real. I, I haven't actually done any simulation, or at least much simulation in this talk. But we are doing some simulation. So we're using a, a network simulator that's kind of popular. I, I now, after we started, my students told me it's kind of old. 
Oops. Uh, in any event, it can, it can simulate 802.11b networks, which are pretty easy to understand. They have good frame structure that we can tear apart and start thinking about what, we're, what we want to see. In particular, we could build a random network at various, with variance interference and traffic levels and look at that traffic and try to transcribe the existence of certain edges in these complexes by seeing, ah, I saw a packet go from this node to that node. That probably means there's a link. Okay. And you can end up sounding the packets pretty nicely this way. Unfortunately, NS2 does not simulate wireless de degradation, but I think that's a long way off at this point to verify that this kind of methodology works. Of course, here's a, a transcript of the sort of thing. So this is, this is one of our networks that's built up each of these guys here. This is actually animated, so you can see these are dropped packets that are being sent, and they've failed to, to go through the network in certain places. And we get this, this detailed transcript of all of the different kinds of packets that are getting passed around. They're full Ethernet frames, and we can pull that into the mathematical framework. And that's what we're in the midst of doing. So thank you for your time. I hope this one's enjoyable. Any when we talk about this uh, categorification of yes. the... Uh, this, you mean the categorization of the sheaf? You want to compute the cohomology of the sheaf? That's right. So in fact, we're starting out with a sheaf of sets. A sheaf of sets is something that I do not have enough structure to compute cohomology in particular. I can't compute cohomology outright. So, but if I categorify it, lift it so now it's a sheaf of vector spaces, then I can compute cohomology. The problem is interpreting these cohomology classes. They're characteristic classes that tell me something, something about my underlying network. But it's unclear exactly what all of them mean. Some of them you can actually sit down and say, OK, with this basis, I know what this means. This means this is traffic that's winding its way through the network in this fashion. But it's not clear where I have these mixed states what it means. Because there's superpositions of various states, none of which are actually legal from the point of view of the media access protocol. So the, the question is, what, what's the right what interpretation of them? In some sense, the way mathematicians will often do is they'll say, well, I don't care exactly what the interpretation is. It gives me a means for discriminating between certain kinds of behavior, uh, and they're kind of coarse. So when I have my mathematician hat on, I'm very happy. When I put on my engineer hat, I get very disappointed. It's possible to build a connection between this, uh, this, this interpretation with this, uh, this uh, topology of the uh, network, the Higher dimensional, for example, you mentioned the uh, higher dimensional uh, homology group has mm -hmm. to do right. with interpretation of network being seen. But, uh, it's possible to build a connection. I, I, I think it is, and I, th and I think it's I think it's just under the surface, to be honest. And the fact is, we have a higher dimensional base space model, and there are some pretty strong theorems in sheaf theory that tell you how that constrains what what data that will support. And so those theorems will tell you something about. Um, the kind of structure that you'll see on the homological level. No, it's, they're all about on the homological level. So if we're dealing with, 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 with just a sheaf of sets, it doesn't make any sorts of claims about that. It only makes claims when we lift into homology. So there is a connection there, but, but it needs to be studied a bit more. Any other questions? Yes. Huh? Did you validate any of the models? What's that? Did you validate? Did validate. Did I validate? So that's what we're just starting to go into, is validating these models against simulated traffic. Okay. Uh, what, what, what are the models useful for? So we're specifically looking for situations that can we predict uh, when a particular kind of network, particular network, is going to start dropping a lot of packets unexpectedly, or what, or what will trigger it to start dropping large amounts of packets because traffic is simply not getting through anymore. So the, 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 I, I guess the question is, are the, the models that we're using are validated against some kind of simulated experimental ground truth, that being the behavior of the packets. So uh, given a topology and... Can you speak up a little bit? Uh, yeah, so given a topology and, and traffic sources, you, right. are, you are trying to predict uh, do you assume a certain route, routing? No, no we're not assuming. Th th this, so uh, actually, that, that, that's a good question that I, that I did gloss over slightly, um, that the routing is managed by the, this media access sheath. So in particular, it's not asking to specifically say, I'd like to get traffic from here to here. 
because that, that, that's what I would posit if I wanted to say get traffic from this node to that node and a particular sequence of packets to get through that way. I'm merely asking, is it possible for me to get traffic from one side to the other in some fashion? But I'm not specifically positing a particular set of routes. I, I'm, I'm asking not the, if you will, I'm asking the sufficiency question, not, necessar not the ne necessariness of it. Is it sufficient that I might be able to get network traffic through it? Yes, that's, that's something that we could do. But we're not specifically positing that very fine scale routing protocol or that very fine scale choice of which nodes are getting used and how. I'm, le I'm letting that come out of the topology in the sense that I'm letting the model decide how that, that plays out. It's, it's sort of a non-traditional way of looking at this. Certainly. But, but the, the, the outcome of whether you're dropping packets or not depends a lot <coughs> I agree. on the choose, choice of routes. I, I, I totally agree. And so the, the, que the question is, what, what we're trying to do is, remember the way I posited this from the beginning. I want to abstract away as much of that as I can. At some point, yes, I'm going to have to make that, those kind of choices. And then this model will, will, will start to become a lot more constrained. But I'm trying to, to step back from that as long as I can. It's a very interesting model. There's nothing like that anywhere close in the networking. Cool. All right. It seems to me, uh, though, that actually uh, given, given the structure that you're following, this is more uh, actually amenable to uh, uh, trying to design a specific uh, topology because you want to abstract away as much of the parameters and and then you can, in other words, look look at the uh, mm -hmm. at how it's performing and then add in mm -hmm. add in uh, you know piecemeal uh, mm -hmm. the, the the various parameter and and looking at the impact. Yeah, that, that, the the design question is something we hadn't even started to go down merely asking this from the analysis point of view, but you're absolutely right. Once we have some understanding of, for instance, this network will do pretty well regardless of the protocol, great, we'll stick with that, or this particular network is something that is bad regardless of the protocol, like, for instance, that network that had that narrow isthmus in there. That's always a problem regardless of what protocol you choose. Don't build them that way. So it does let you make those kind of broad brush arguments. Any other questions? One more question? Okay, if not, let's thank our speaker again.